Good afternoon. How are you? Who's sleeping? Raise your hand, please. Off script already. Uh, when I was in US 2010, I was attending uh, the first AWS uh, conference. It was very unknown for us in Sweden. And the gentleman, uh, the instructor, he said, you know, you can use DynamoDB or, DB or <coughs> Mongo. 2011. So I knew about MongoDB back then. You know, I just got a better price now. <laughs> All right, so short agenda. I'm going to talk about Toyota and quality. And then I'm going to tell you about who I am. Then I'm going to tell you some more about the Industry 4.0 and the software house uh, and our principles. And I think that's why you're here, because we're going to share some very intimate stuff about how we work. And I think it's going to inspire you. And obviously, why we chose MongoDB. So uh, I'm going to use my uh, cheat, uh, my document DB here as well. So at Toyota, we love to talk about quality. It's, it's kind of our core. And the, the brand is obviously synonym with quality. And we try to, uh, to improve and redefine quality in every corner of, of the company today. And today, we, we say that quality is easy, fast, and reliable. Yeah, that's the new definition. And speaking of that, how many did do some shopping yesterday during Cyber Monday? All right, a few. How many bought a TV? All right, cool. The world record of buying a TV through web to delivery, you know how many blah, blah it takes? Eight minutes. Eight minutes in China where you could actually, there was actually a guy, we, we, we did some research about this. He woke up and he realized he needed a new TV. So he went to the web and said, I want this TV. Eight minutes later, Someone knocked on his door and he got his TV. And that's incredible. And that's the whole logistic part of being able to deliver something so quickly. It's just, you know, wow. This handsome face is obviously me. And my name is Philip Dadgar. And I have been at Toyota for one year and four months today. Uh, before that, I was used to work at Microsoft, before that, Ericsson, and then AstraZeneca, and then some other companies. I'm driven by three forces in life. Passion, because if we believe in something, we can do it. Empathy, it's because if I understand what you need, then I can probably deliver it. And obviously, imagination. If we can think of it, we can do it. And these have been my driving forces the whole life. And that's probably why I'm standing here and giving you this presentation about Toyota. Maybe I should tell you that you know, I might look very young, and I am, by heart. But I have experienced 2,400 bouts modems. Anyone else here? There we go, a few lucky ones. There we go. Perfect. And also was part of the reference architecture 5G at Ericsson. So you know, a good journey. Now we head into Industry 4.0. Everyone loves, loves to talk about Industry 4.0. <coughs> MongoDB does, and you're good at it. And it's all about connecting you know, everything. The, the machine to machine, uh, everything should be connected to tell us what's happening and things like that, right? And I used to love to read about this stuff when I was a kid in any sci-fi book. But today, at Toyota, we have the ambition to lead that industry. And we are doing everything we can to urbanize the logistic solutions. And the reason for that is because we have gathered data for about 80,000 manual forklifts for about <coughs> eight years. So we have a lot of data. And this data gives us the ability and vision to create a sustainable and efficient change in the logistic solutions. How many of you have forklift uh, driver license? There we go. In Sweden, we actually have negative employment for forklift drivers. We have more forklifts than drivers. So what we do is we have the manual ones, about 80,000. We, we have a factory in Mjölby where we produce about 80,000 of these. And we also have automated trucks that kind of take care of everything themselves without a driver. So we automate the whole warehouse with these auto trucks.
The customer ranch is everything between producing tires to cheese. The cheese is funny because imagine having this round circle of cheese and you're kind of moving it with a forklift with a normal speed and then you hit the brakes because you're gonna kind of, you know, put it down. But the cheese fl flies away because it's, you know, slippery. So we have a lot of challenges, but, you know, but we, we, we do good. And to be able to lead, to lead, it has not been a, you know, a challenge to, to invent or use new technology. The challenge has to be, or has been, to change from the inside, the cultural and the mindset for how to produce quality with a fast, easy, and reliable model. We have an R&D center in Gothenburg, where I'm from, and we have safe, scale, agile framework, if you're familiar with it, that kind of keeps us together and makes us as agile as possible, all right? And we do, obviously, product development. How many others are doing product development here? Yeah, there we go. And it's probably the most underestimated effort that anyone can do. It's not, not easy to produce or a product that, that can change the behavior of the industry that hasn't been in need of change for 100 years. But we are doing our best, and we are very successful. We started with a, with a pallet, the Euro pallet. That's our heritage. And the wooden one was used for uh, uh, loading train cars. And 1961, two Swedish brothers from Gilsjö in Skåne, that's like Denmark. <laughs> All right. Uh, they invented this. And by doing that, the uh, <laughs> European Railroad, Railroad commissioned this to be the standard model of pallets. And by using that pallet, they decreased the loading time by 90% at 1961. So it would require 10% effort to load railroads. Where we are today, where we have the manual forklifts and the automated forklifts, <laughs> And you know, when you think about it, what do we actually do with the forklifts? We move a pallet from point A to point B. But usually, and most of the time, it's not just forklifts, especially the automated ones. They are not the only ones doing stuff. There are people around as well. So the most common warehouse for us is a hybrid, where people actually run around and do crazy stuff. Machines you can predict, right? Humans a bit harder. Our future is obviously built on uh, intelligence. We think, and we are doing a lot of cool pocs right now, where the machines or the devices or the units, by having the right amount of data and the right amount of access to data, can predict what needs to be moved when and where. So really cool. In Gothenburg, the R&D center, we have uh, established something we call the software house. And we set a vision for four years. And we've been trying to you know, come up with an with a idea for how to do this change that we need to do from a software part. Our wanted state is obviously to be a trusted enabler by software. Toyota, quality, hardware. Now we want to achieve that on the software level as well. We have identified five blocks that we think is going to take us there, the strategic blocks that are going to be changed or removed when we are done. The first one that I'm responsible for is uh, obviously the modular architecture. The second one is continuous integration and delivery. Third one is technology leadership. Fourth is partnership. And the fifth is community. Because by end of the day, it's going to be people using our products. And by end of the day, those products are going to be developed by humans. So we want to maintain a good community of sharing values. And those values are based on our fundamentals. One source of truth, MongoDB. That's where the data is. Transparency. We share everything we do in SAFE based on the community of practices and things like that. 
ways of working, which is again safe, and the know-how. We want to know how to build, or we, we want to know where we can find the help to do this, the Mongo University. And these are all based on the famous Toyota values. So to get there, we need to, to you know, share the same thoughts about what is modular architecture. The design of the overall application should not be static, which makes sense. But it's really hard to, to get there at Toyota because we have been very good at testing our stuff. And we want, we are, with the software part, we want to be you know, more dynamic. We want to change things when it's as quickly as possible, fast and reliable. We also say that we can evolve a monolith. And these are kind of the steering factors for when we want to do things, right? We also say that we can merge microservices when it makes sense. We can also say that we can sometimes add a temporary feature to a service like a bandwagon, as long as we don't the life cycle of that feature. And we also agree to, to share any knowledge that we gather in the agile teams, so no one has to do the same work again, all right? And at Toyota, we talk about something called Zero Muda. Anyone who speaks Japanese, Peter? There you go. Zero Muda means zero waste. And that's part of our quality. So we don't want to redo the same thing that someone else has done. And in my power, I have forced all the devs to sign this manifesto with blood. We say that this manifesto, it's pretty much like the Agile manifesto. Have, have you read it? Those two, yeah? So this is ours. And we say that this manifesto should be reviewed and changed annually based on what's happening in the company and the trends and all that. Or on demand, someone, anyone can come and tell me, you know, we need to change that manifesto. He has to have a very good excuse though, but you know. We also say that we embrace sharing collaboration model to guard our manifesto. So everyone are responsible for maintaining this manifesto at code level. And the principles that I'm gonna share with you is that we develop our, our ecosystem based on decoupled microservices, and they can evolve independently. We apply domain-driven design. How many work with DDD here? There you go, good start, there we go. How many know what DDD means? Oh, that's good. So we say domain-driven design because if you, if you imagine you have an e-commerce product, you kind of want to be able to follow an order from where the customer purchased something to pays and follow you know, the, all the transactions to actual delivery to that customer, right? And order should be the same thing through the whole system. That's basically the, the domain. But we also have two principles baked into that one. My favorites. Least astonishment. It's from the UX. How many times have you visited a web page and the button for whatever was not there where you expected it to be? You know, it happens all the time. Or you buy a new TV and the Netflix button is where it's not supposed to be. Maybe the volume should be there instead. So we talk about things that should not surprise, you know? We need to have that idea when we develop products to not surprise other customers with you know, things that don't make any sense. <laughs> and also, the least effort. We are lazy, all of us. Even I'm lazy. I actually slept on the train here for 10 minutes. And what I mean with lazy effort, uh, or <laughs> least effort, is that we do the least possible thing to achieve the goal. And that's human nature, all right? Third one, and this is the hardest one. We need to have an API lifecycle model. How many of you here have that responsibility? Oh my God, we need to talk later. We also want to separate business logic. We have developed a framework 
where we kind of abstracted away everything that has to do with cloud, infrastructure, network, storage, database, and whatnot. We want our developers to solve business problems. All right? And these microservices that we produce should be so small that it would be very easy for us to change them when we need it. And obviously the fact that everything that can break will break. So we embrace the idea of failure. And we try and we do our best to prevent failures in our services and systems. And the last one, we, we are using solid as code, code principle. How many are familiar with solid? Wow. You guys should move to your Gothenburg. <laughs> so the definition of uh, the coupled microservices. We think they are very, very specialized. They can scale. They are autonomous. And they can only by, be accessed by their own APIs. Anyone who don't agree? Is this on record, by the way? Don't say anything. Second one is the domain-driven design, and that's our definition. So we don't want to surprise, and we want to make it as lazy as possible. But this requires a lot of time and effort from all the dev teams. And we have about 120 developers today in six to seven teams. And to, for them to be able to collaborate, we need to agree on the domain. The third one, the hardest one, and I think this is where most companies doing the same journey will probably have most challenges to define what an API is and how the life cycle of the API is. Because in our business, in the logistic solutions, our customers become dependent and build their own business logic on top of our APIs. So we cannot change them as we would want to. So we have agreed on, uh, on classification and versioning. That's the start. Since we, <laughs> we have customers ranging from producing tires to cheese to airports, we want to separate the business logic from the code as much as possible. And the only thing that stops us from doing the impossible is obviously the laws of physics. We are doing a cloud journey at the same time. So we are now with the microservice, obviously, having to maintain more than one node or one monolith or one database. No more bestemmed form in Swedish. So we need to design the services so that they cannot fail if something disappears. You know, the least astonishment model. Who knows them by, uh, by, uh, by memory? The solid principles. Ah, there we go. So solid is uh, the single responsibility principle. And this is very down you know, into the code, the actual code. So we say a class should have one and only one reason to change, which is, you know, should be common knowledge. We also say open for extension, close for modification. We say, uh, how should I explain this in an easy manner? I will not. This one is more interesting. And it's very commonly you know, misused in all uh, development. And that's when a client is forced to implement an interface that it's not going to use. Dependency inversion. These are really hard stuff to digest on a Tuesday afternoon. So let's go to the fun part. So when we started to look at uh, you know, where, where should we have our main data, where should we maintain the data, how should we build the microservices that we want to build to, to get where we want to be, we started to evaluate different type of uh, storage solutions. And we had some criteria uh, 
Uh, performance obviously was one of the key drivers. Latency comes with that. Then we said that we want something that uh, can scale automatically. Uh, the maintenance of it should not be our problem. It should be a managed service. Of course, security and compliance, because we have so much data that, that comes in. Uh, and even if we anonymize all the data, we still have to obviously stick to GDPR and those different laws that exist in Europe. How close is the data? Because we have some uh, policies that, on a very higher level at Toyota, that governs us as well. And in our case, we choose Azure as platform. So we want the data to be in Europe or European Union. Again, maintenance is not our thing. We want to develop products. So we want something that does the backup parts for us automatically. And one of the th key things that I you know, love to talk about is to be as agnostic as possible. We don't want to be locked into any diff you know, vendor, cloud vendor. So we said we want the data store that, that we can move. And Boris just mentioned it so beautifully. You just click a button and you're somewhere else, even on-prem. And of course, it should be easy for our developers to understand and use the, the data store. And it was not a hard choice at all because uh, do, do I need to say anything? No. Have you met these people? They are always happy to help us. They always smile. They always give us the best support. And I'm not saying this because I'm standing here. That's, that's the, you know, the passion and the, the honesty and the empathy part. This was actually the key factor for us. Because in all business, like 99.99% .99 of all the business that is done in the world is based on relationships, right? And we managed to build a quick, nice relationship, love by on, on first sight in April. Yeah. And of course, latency and availability. Uh, we have a hosted Mongo in Azure, through Azure. It was really easy to plan for, uh, for the dev teams to attend the university. So they could plan them in their sprints. We didn't have to you know, guard them. They could do it when they, they could and when they had time. And the most beautiful part is that the data models are, uh, they are objects. So for the developers, it's easy, really easy for them to, to, to work with objects rather than data models. And since we have this bounded context model where, where events are very important to us, it's kind of everything that happens in the system creates something and we store all things that happen in the system in MongoDB. And we are very happy with that choice. And as I said, we have this framework where we put the abstract away as much as possible. And it was really easy for us to, to put MongoDB in the framework as well. So even if we would have a new, someone coming from university today without having any knowledge about microservices or anything else, they would not need to understand anything about MongoDB either, except the university and sign the manifesto by blood. And the peering, because security is obviously a key driver for us. We, we, we saw the possibility to be able to peer our own subscriptions to Mongo subscriptions, hosted backups, and everything just works out of box. So very, very happy choice. And uh, it has given us tons of uh, good uh, knowledge and uh, challenges, but we are very happy. That was it. <laughs> I saved that one. I saved that one. Thank you. So are there, any, um, are there any questions? What kind of challenges have you faced during the implementation phase? We are moving a monolith, and we slice it piece by piece based on the fast, easy, reliable model. So we want to move the quality parts. and. When we do that, we do a lot of refactoring, obviously. And we also change the data store at the same time. So that's an ongoing thing. Uh, anyone else? No? My best presentation ever. Good. I'm still kidding. <laughs> so I had a question. Oh, my god. Um, how many? You talked about having 120 developers. Yep. So how many are, are using MongoDB today? 45. Okay. Yeah. So, so we have two business half. units, uh, the, the one with uh, the telematic platform, 
that, that handles those 80,000 trucks that dial home. They are about 45 people, and we are using MongoDB mainly for uh, the digital services right now. Uh, the other one, the automation is more, more of an on-prem solution because most of the time, all these warehouses or factories are disconnected because of security. So it, it makes it more challenging you know, to, to go this way right now. And have you, I'm just taking over now as the Q&A, have, um, like, have you seen any, because we often, you know, going around the Nordics, we often see a lot of um, uh, Lord Stong. Lord Stong. Resistance. Resistance, yeah. thank you. Who's the Englishman here? Um, we often see a lot of resistance within organizations when you move from a legacy world, yep. SQL, on-premise, monolithic, to then microservices, you know, um, the future, if you like. Obviously, you've, you've, you've employed a lot of, of new developers to help with that change. Yep. But uh, have there been any other, have there been any challenges in that sense? in terms of organizational, getting people on board, because then there's a snowball effect, I guess. Yeah, it is. But I think uh, one thing coming from Microsoft and Ericsson and these other really you know, product developing companies where software is their bread and butter, uh, I had the impression of new devs would, would embrace the idea of microservices and event-driven architecture. But I think the universities have kind of missed that part. Mm -hmm. So they kind of had to relearn some of the stuff. In our case, it didn't, you know, it didn't bother us because we planned for 10 weeks increments, program increments. And each uh, sprint is two weeks. And the last one is uh, saved or reserved for innovation. The new devs, they cannot innovate because they have to do some study instead. So we solved it that way. Yeah. Nice, nice. Well, uh, yes, you've got a question. Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, you mentioned very shortly, so easily, moving data models as objects and the challenges for older developers like people with beard like me. Maybe you can talk a little bit and spend a minute on talking about what this means, what was the journey to take a data model, how to move it from an historic tab tabular system to mm -hmm. the MongoDB model. Uh, <clears throat> back in the days when you had the relational database, you had this, this big, large blob where everything was connected. So when you, you wanted to query something, especially if you, if you had a code first model, where you, maybe you didn't have any DBA or you just built something and it became really you know, beautiful product that people started to use, then you really don't, didn't have any idea how things were connected. So every query was, was very, very costly. Uh, so if, especially if it was orders that you wanna, you, know, you wanna have a query about the order. Then you have to kind of go down and bring up the whole database update something here, and then blah, write it down again. And that requires a lot of, obviously, uh, power, storage, and things like that. But moving to this context, now we have our domains, where we have the microservices, where they have special uh, responsibilities. They are only responsible for their own data. And then we maybe have another service that combines the data from these two. So the load on the system becomes much more spread. Uh, it's independent. We don't have to think about one database. And since everything talks to each other through APIs, we don't have any, any hard uh, connections. So it's, it's much easier for us. And the fact that we know that that service has that data, that also gives us the contracts and the domain model as well, because somehow we, we decided that, OK, this service is going to do this then it's responsible for this domain. And it kind of gave us the free, free of charge model. Good, thank you, Philip. Thank you. Any remaining questions of anyone? Any hard ones? Yeah, go on, no. give a hard one. No, I, I'm hard just kidding. One? Hang on, wait. Uh, what's your plan with uh, the data that you collect? Because Ooh. How do you split uh, unnecessary data or the old data, historical data, how do you do that? Or how do you use only the... No, 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 we have a machine learning expert here. But the thing is, old data doesn't necessarily mean good data. That, that's our problem. Uh, because especially when I used to work at Microsoft, I would visit anyone and they would say, we have, you know, we have this database. It's been there for 30 years. We have gathered data for 30 years. Can you build an AI? And I would say, you know, what's the question? 
what, what do you want to solve? And usually you don't you don't know that because if you knew that you had probably be. And the same goes for us. But we had some really clever people who started this business, who had this vision of the you know big industry four zero uh, push. What do you want to call it? Because today when we when we manufacture these trucks, the forklifts in Yelby, we ship them with an IoT device from factory. And we've been doing that for eight years, which is awesome. So we knew exactly how about the data, how the data was structured. So we knew that when they dial home, we know exactly what they are going to tell us. And we have um, uh, data analysts that look at the data today. And we have uh, some awesome, cool features and services built on top of the, the platform right now that are usually for optimizing for the logistic uh, solutions that the customer are, are using. It could be for things like, how often should they recharge the batteries? So all of that is, uh, is on the MongoDB platform. The whole data is laying in yeah. here for whatever service. Yeah. yeah. If you can very briefly exemplify how MongoDB helped you with compliance, in particular GDPR, because you had it on your slide. That was the toughest question. Help. <laughs> I read the documentation. And now I'm, I'm serious. I read the documentation, and luckily, being part of Toyota, we have a legal department. So I delegated that part to to the to our DPA people. Would you like me to answer? Yes, please. <laughs> okay. So the, so the data is stored in um, Ireland, Ivan. What? Amsterdam with backup in Ireland. So therefore, the data never leaves Europe. That's the answer that Philip was looking for. Yep. <laughs> now we've warmed up, guys. See? Put one over here. And I'm not sweating because I don't know the answers. It's really warm down here. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, the thing with the GDPR is talking about the secure storage, uh, secure transfer, and the possibility to clean up uh, the history uh, when it's, the data is you know, not needed uh, and to make sure that the data is complete and uh, correct when you store it, if you need to store it. So how this part is covered in MongoDB? Luckily, this guy wants to answer. <laughs> So they, in MongoDB, you can encrypt data uh, in flight when you're transmitting it, TLS. You can encrypt it at rest as well. And um, there's a latest feature, uh, which is field level encryption. It's in beta right now, but it makes it really easy to encrypt and have an encryption key per user. So you can implement the right to be forgotten. You just throw away the key no one can use the data anymore. So it's a very easy way to, to gain compliance. Again, the technology itself does not give you compliance. It's a mix of uh, people, process, and technology. But at least the technical part is uh, solved. Yeah? OK. Going, going. Any cases where actually MongoDB was not the right solution for your data? Um, you know, no, I would say so far everything has worked as we wanted to. But it is easier to have a monolith. But it doesn't scale. Yeah. Or you have to throw a lot of money on hardware. But so far, very good. OK, thanks. <laughs> So if you compare uh, your mon monolithic uh, uh, software with your uh, uh, SQL database, uh, like could you like the operational cost compared to MongoDB? Ooh, yeah, uh, uh, is it cheaper or more expensive? Or like it is. How would you? It is. Uh, the thing is, when when you have a SQL server, especially in a monolith, that is historically probably on prem in your own data centers. Uh, and being a large company as we, we obviously have partners that help us with these kind of stuff. I think what we gain from moving from SQL in this case to MongoDB with a hosted model was the speed and velocity to be able to try new things quicker. Uh, and 
I would say the cost saving is done there rather than on the actual platform. Right. Okay, thanks. I mean, just to add to that, right? So we signed the contract and then literally within two weeks, we trained I don't know, 20 of your developers. Yep. And then within like two months, you were starting to go like pre-production. Yep. Within three months, they'd gone live. That's the kind of, from literally like not knowing MongoDB, three months going live on 14 microservices is exceptional and is, is in no small part to Philip and how he's running his organization, but it's- uh, I'm not alone. I have some really, really awesome people. I just have ideas about things. They do it. Yeah. There are many um, nowhere scale uh, databases in the market like Cassandra or managed service on AWS. Uh, when you choose like mm -hmm. nowhere scale database, what MongoDB has the advantage that make you choose? Uh, I actually had those slides, uh, but we removed them. Uh, timing, timing and the effort in, uh, in uh, regards to time to get something done. MongoDB beat all of them. When we talked about months and weeks, MongoDB was hours and minutes. And that was exactly like Alistair said, from getting the devs to understand how it works to, uh, to get something hosted very quickly, the managed service model, the university, and all of them added or saved us a lot of time. And uh, since time is moving, <laughs> it, it was a very easy choice. And we compared it to obviously to Cosmos and some others that I'm not allowed to talk about, but you know. Weeks to minutes. All right, guys, should we let, let, let Philip go or no. anyone else? Okay, Philip, I've uh, I've gone to great expense. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. This is my <laughs> gift from, from me to you. Finally. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.